Our gospel today is split up in two main topics. One, God's glory, especially found in the person of Jesus Christ. Two, the new commandment of love. We are called to love one another as Jesus has loved us. And the two cannot be separated. Before we know what it means to love one another as Jesus has loved us, we have to talk about his glory. Now, how important is God's glory to you? How important is God's glory to me? Well, to tell you the truth, God's glory is the reason why we exist, the reason why we are alive. That is our goal. That is our end as human beings to live in God's glory. That's what it means to be in heaven, to see the face of God, to see him in all of his glory. St. Paul tells us in the letter to the Corinthians, all of us gazing with unveiled face on the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So I ask you today, as I begin this homily, do you give glory to God? Do you give glory to God every day? Do you praise him? Do you bless him? Do you adore him, especially in the holy sacrament of the altar? And what do I mean by glory, specifically God's glory? Glory is the highest form of praise. It's when we acknowledge God's beauty, his majesty, his omnipotence, and his power. So again, do you give God glory, or do you glory yourself? Do you give glory to other things? Do you give glory to other people? You know, at times, I think, especially in the world today that we live in, I think we can easily give glory to electronics, like our smartphone. Are you on your smartphone a lot more than you're praying and giving glory to God? Do you give glory to your wall on Facebook? That seems to be a time waster. Do you give glory to other people? people, such as maybe a movie star or an athlete or your favorite musician, just imagine for a second if you were in a restaurant and your favorite famous person was sitting right next to you at the table besides you, would you be overly concerned about what they were eating? what they were wearing, whether or not you could ask for their autograph, and things like this. I'm not saying that you can't respect people, that you can't acknowledge what they have done, their work ethic or their career, but are you putting them on a plane as if they were God? This can turn into the sin of what we call flattery. You can be a, a flatterer, where there is immoderate praise, where you're giving due to someone what God alone deserves. So this is something that we should ask ourselves when we're talking about God's glory. We can even make a saint as if he or she is God. Obviously, we esteem saints, we venerate them, but at times, we can think that they're Jesus himself. And that's also too much of flattery, which can even turn in 
to idolatry. Now, with this in mind as we're talking about the glory of God, it should be reminded, especially in the Easter season, that Jesus has a glorified body. After he died and rose from the dead, his body was glorified. If you read in the Gospels, Jesus had special attributes in his glorified body. He was able to walk through walls. He was able to, it would seem like, disappear and reappear as he willed. So traditionally, with a small t in our church, God willing, we will have a glorified body reunited with our soul and have these same attributes. So there are four traditional things we teach in terms of a glorified body. One, impassibility. No more suffering, no more pain, no more sadness, no more sickness in our glorified body. It'll be perfect forever. Secondly, brightness or glory. Most likely with our glorified body, we will be brighter than the physical sun. God's glory is greater than anything physical here on earth. Thirdly, agility, where our souls will have complete dominion over our bodies. So let's just say if I wanted to go back home to California right now, I can will it in my mind, in my soul, but my body would keep me from going there instantly. I would obviously have to either drive or fly to get back to California. But with our glorified bodies, all we have to do is will it, and we will move faster than the speed of light with our glorified body, something I'm definitely looking forward to on the day of resurrection. Lastly, subtility. As I mentioned, Jesus walked through walls or walked through doors. I would say most likely we will be able to do the same with a glorified body. Now here's the catch as we talk about glory and especially Jesus and his glorified body. He is also a victim forever in his glorified body. So God willing, when we get to heaven and we see Jesus face to face, we will actually see holes in his hands. We will see holes in his feet and an opening in his side. He chooses to keep his wounds of victory on the cross as signs of love for each and every single one of us. He will forever be a priest. He will forever be a victim out of love for each and every single one of us. You know, there's a wonderful story to highlight this. St. Martin of Tours, he was a bishop living in France in the early church. And he was praying in his church, and he was praying in, from an, in front of an image of Jesus Christ. And while he was praying, supposedly he had an apparition. And it looked like Jesus Christ. And Jesus was hovering over St. Martin of Tours. And St. Martin of Tours looked at this apparition of Jesus, and do you know what he did to that apparition? He spat on him. He spit on him. And it would seem like a horrible thing to do. And after he spat on what looked like Jesus, do you know what happened? Slowly, that apparition of Jesus turned into the devil. And the devil said, Martin, how did you know it was me? 
and not Jesus. And St. Martin of Tours said, it's easy. Satan, when you supposedly were trying to trick me by looking like Jesus, I saw that you did not have any wounds. There were no holes in your hands. There were no holes in your feet. And you, Satan, would never suffer for anyone. Therefore, be gone. And the devil, as he gets, was livid. He was angry and left St. Martin of Tours. So God's glory, although he chooses to be a victim forever, he does so out of love for us. Glory is a result of victory over sin and death. Glory is given to people by God in their struggle versus evil and their reward for virtue. When someone is truly glorious, they participate or share in God's glory. Now, how does God's glory tie in with the second part of the gospel as we mentioned earlier, that is, his commandment to love? Well, sharing in God's glory is a result of love. Not any love, probably the, you, the love that you're used to hearing on this earth, but specifically sacrificial love. If you want to share in God's glory, if you want to be in heaven forever, then live in sacrificial love. Love that is not selfish, but is selfless. Now, what is the true definition of love? We've heard it many times here, being preached at the Fathers of Mercy Chapel. Love is wanting or willing what's best for the other, St. Thomas Aquinas states. So what's best for the other? What's best for your friend? What's best for your parent? what's best for anyone in this world? Heaven. That's the reason why we exist. Union with God. So if you love someone, you're helping them get to heaven. You're helping them grow in virtue. Something that you might want to ask yourself on a daily basis. So here, to live in God's glory, let us ask ourselves if we're living in sacrificial love. Here are some attributes some qualities of living in sacrificial love. Do you make up for other people's sins? A valid question to ask yourself. That's exactly what Jesus did when he died on the cross for us. He made our sins his own. He nailed our sins to the cross. Although we need to make up for our own sins, out of sacrificial love, we could help by making up for other people's sins. It's what you call acts of reparation. Since we're the mystical body of Christ, since we're all connected, we could make up for other people's sins. That's part of sacrificial love, something that you might want to do every day. Parents, are you making up for your children's sins? Children, are you doing reparation, acts of reparation for your parents' sins? Are we, as citizens of the United States of America, making reparation for sins quite possibly of our government? Maybe our world would be a lot better place if we did a lot more reparation for other people's sins in sacrificial love. Two, do you make excuses for the people that sin against you. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, as he made up for these people's sins, do you know what he said? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Although they crucified him, he not only forgave them, he made excuses for them. In other words, 
Do you judge people? You can certainly judge external actions, but you can't judge their intentions, why they do certain things. So forgive, in a certain sense, forget and make excuses in sacrificial love for one another. Do you purposely or voluntarily live uncomfortably to help other people? Do you go maybe feed the poor, visit the sick, clothe the naked? Although these are hard things for us because we live in a selfish society, that's exactly what Jesus did when he became man. He was subject to time and space. Jesus, as God, had to eat. He had to sleep. He had to go to the bathroom. He had to read a book. God had to read a book. Do you do the same for your brothers and sisters in sacrificial love? Lastly, and certainly not least, would you die, possibly physically, for someone else? I think it's easier said than done. I would die, you would say, maybe for your spouse, maybe for your children or your best friend. But would you die for your enemies? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to help someone get to heaven, even if they're the worst person in the world? You know, I contemplate, especially in prayer, whether or not I would be able to say yes to martyrdom. It would seem like, especially in the way that we're going in our country, it's possible that there will be lots of Christian martyrs in the near future. But what comes to my mind every time I think of dying for someone else is being faithful in small or little things. Obviously, giving your life for someone else is the greatest thing that you can do. But we should ask ourselves if we are faithful in the little victories that God is asking us to do on a daily basis, whether we're finishing our work well, at the desk, at work, offering it to God. Whether or not we maybe avoid watching risque things on TV or listening to horrible music that doesn't have anything to do with glorifying God. Are we victorious in these little things? Well, if you are, then there's a good chance that you would be able to die for someone else. This is sacrificial love. You know, St. Augustine, he commented on this gospel passage. He said, anyone can bless himself with the sign of the cross. Anyone can answer amen like we do here at Mass. Anyone can sing alleluia. Anyone can be baptized, enter churches, build the walls of basilica. But he says, But the only thing that distinguishes the children of God is charity. No matter what you have, if you do not have this one thing, everything else is of no avail. So when Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, he is asking us to love infinitely, inexhaustibly, by God's grace, we are called to love one another in a very divine way. So love in the New Testament is not measured by man anymore. It's measured by Christ. Something definitely to pray and think about. So let me help you as a priest. Let me help you first live in God's glory by living in sacrificial love. What can we do to do that? First, and in this order, give glory to God, then you will have the grace to love your neighbor as Jesus has loved us. God first, your neighbor second. Notice that we, what we say often. Glory to God in the highest. 
and then peace to people of goodwill, we say at Mass, at the beginning of Mass. Glory be first to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Then we can help others. We say in the doxology at Mass, through him, with him, and in him, all glory and honor is yours, God, forever and ever. So I think we could say the secret, so to speak, of our gospel passage today is to give glory by sacrificial love. And here's the beautiful part for all of you here in this nice chapel of divine mercy. The way we can give glory to God most is to participate in the sacrifice of Mass. This instant, when Jesus is offered to the Father, is the greatest glory that we can give to God. When you put yourself on the paten, when you put yourself in the chalice, and as you conform your will to God's will on a daily basis, you are giving glory to God par excellence. There is no other way that's better to give glory to God than doing so at Mass. This is a beautiful aspect of our Catholic Christian faith. So here at the altar, at the communion rail, is the one place we give God the highest praise and glory. Now, speaking of this, I remember reading of a life of a saint who was devoted to the Eucharist, that wanted to give glory to God in everything, including sacrificial love. His name was Ignatius. And there's a story that Ignatius was actually one of the children that was called upon Jesus to come to me. He said, let the children come to me. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you become childlike. And they say it's a custom that he was one of those children in the Gospels. So after he grew up, he became a priest, he became a bishop. And what was going on at that time, there was a Roman emperor, and he won a war, a battle, and he commanded all the people of that region that they would have to sacrifice to idols. They would have to give glory to these false gods. And Ignatius was forced to do so, but he didn't cave in. He didn't give in. He said, I would rather die than give glory to a false god. So what did the emperor Trajan do? He literally took Ignatius to a Colosseum and he threw him in the Colosseum and he let out lions to devour him. Maybe three or four lions. And while they were bringing Ignatius to his execution by being eaten by lions, he said one word the whole time, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And his executioners asked, why are you saying this word? And he stated, because Jesus is written on my heart. And in sacrificial love, I would rather die than commit this sin of idolatry. So eventually they threw him to the lions. He was devoured. And there were only a few bones and his heart on the ground after he died. And what did the pagans do? They literally took his heart and they cut it open. And what did they see written on his heart? It was actually written in gold. It said the words, Jesus Christ. 
the glory of God as man fully alive. If we want to participate and share in God's glory, we are called to love one another as he has loved us. A love described as a sacrificial love.